All right. Uh, uh, good morning from my side. Uh, I hope you're having a really uh, great evening. I really enjoyed uh, Nicholas' uh, uh, part of the talk. I, I have not seen it before. And uh, Klaus, you made a, a wonderful summary of uh, your your other uh, long-term pre uh, presentations. And uh, I just want you guys to know that um, uh, talking about type erasure is itself very hard because you have to have a combination of several design patterns. That is what gives it rise to the, the, the whole thing of, of what type erasure is, okay? And uh, later on, we'll we'll see why I say that uh, Klaus Eagleberger is the person who gave me the language to be able to talk properly about uh, my own work. So uh, let us start uh, this presentation. I hope that uh, you see a yellow screen. Yellow is the, the preferred uh, color of the company that I work for. And uh, it has, uh, um, uh, Klaus was uh, telling you, I do work at the company of Snap. Uh, Snap is the maker of uh, uh, Snapchat, a very famous application. I work in the team that does augmented reality. And uh, doing augmented reality lenses for Snapchat is uh, something that uh, has a really large amount of technical challenges of all types, okay? And of course, the expressivity, the power to be able to express complicated things in software, and uh, the um, uh, power to not lose performance or maybe even gain it if, if at all possible, are truly, truly important for, for, for the team where I work, okay? So what I am going to tell you about is how type erasure should exhibit emergent behavior. And uh, I think it is going to be an appropriate topic for for uh, the state uh, of uh, you guys, uh, friends in, in um, Munich, because uh, it is uh, late in the evening for you after a long uh, day of work, perhaps. So I'm not going to be showing too much code other than uh, maybe at the very end, but I'm going to tell you, share with you something more philosophical in nature, okay? I hope that you like it. Um, so, the uh, other, other thing that uh, needs to be said, I'm just not going to be modest. Uh, I am the author of the suit type ratio framework that uh, uh, I do claim that it has the best performance among implementations of type ratio. If uh, you know of uh, someone or something that uh, might do better, please contact me. And uh, it also has the best modeling power, okay? The only problem is that the compilation errors that I have seen in my type erasure framework are the very worst compilation errors that I have ever seen in my entire career. But uh, it does deliver on the performance and the modeling power. My objective today is to empower you on doing C++ in particular engineering, okay? It's not going to be uh, uh, giving you a recipe, but um, uh, hopefully transmit to you some ideas. And uh, the next important objective is to pay my respects to your group, because uh, the work from, peop uh, from people that, uh, that commingled in, in your group, like uh, Roland Bock, Klaus Eagleberger, uh, new friends like uh, Andreas Weiss, um, I think it is uh, uh, super cool, and uh, I thank you very much for the invitation. And, and I'm going to be working on Klaus Eagleberger's work to show uh, by material facts my appreciation to the efforts that you guys make. All right. Uh, the, what we're going to be talking about is uh, encapsulated in uh, this uh, quotation by uh, the, the founder of uh, the conglomerate that we call today Visa, the Hawk. Um, I don't want to say too much about this person, but he said something that, that it really struck a chord with me, okay? Which is this quotation. I'm going to read it. Simple, clear purpose and principles give rise to complex and intelligent behavior. Complex rules and regulations give rise to simple and stupid behavior. Let me translate that to C++ engineering. The application of the single responsibility principle, in particular, design patterns and generic programming concepts leads to great C++ libraries. And for the very same reasons that uh, the, the then we ought to conclude that the Java programming language sucks. And by the way, I have plenty of uh, coworkers that have to program in 
that programming language because uh, our product is a, a, a major platform is Android that requires uh, to program in Java. So we're going to try to to recover what is it that um, is a limitative of, for example, Java, and what is that is empowering about C++. Okay, just a, a table for establishing the correspondence because this is what we're going to be talking through the rest of the talk. If in natural language we call something simple, in C++ engineering that will probably mean that we are dutifully applying the single responsibility principle. By keeping things doing only one thing is how we have a prayer of hope of uh, making that thing be done right. And that it's easy to compose, easy to understand. That is the key. So simplicity would have to mean in C++ in you're doing something like the single responsibility principle application. When in the citation, it, it talks about clear purpose. I think that we have to refer to the sign patterns because the sign pattern is the way that we have already articulated how to talk about uh, recurring things that happen in software engineering. And uh, that is what gives the clarity, okay? That uh, you are not starting from scratch from um, uh, 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 limited understanding of what that might mean, but you can have resources like uh, the Gang of Four, the Sign Patterns book that everybody on their dog have been uh, reading it since uh, it came, I don't know, 30 years ago perhaps. And uh, so there is already a language, people talk about it, the ideas are clearly articulated and we can disagree or whatever, but that is a very ground, a very good grounding on, on how to do it, okay? Your purpose, the Sign Patterns. And the principles would be the generic programming concepts that we're going to be applying, okay? This is tricky. We're going to talk about it uh, in a moment. Uh, but I, I, I use the word concepts, not like the C++ feature of concepts, but what it has meant uh, from much older than that, which is uh, in, within the context of generic programming, the paradigm of, uh, of computing that attempts to, to, to get... Uh, algorithms and data structures and, and, and the, the, the practice of programming to its most abstract form so that it is devoid of details that make it uh, less composable or less useful. Okay, so the last part is uh, simple rules lead to the simple and purposeful rules lead to complex and intelligent behavior. This is what we want, right? Is this emergent behavior? Indeed, it is emergent behavior. We will talk about uh, uh, what exactly emergent behavior means and what is the relevance to, to C++ engineering momentarily. Okay, my, 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 my uh, presentation today for you guys is focused on libraries in C++ specifically, okay? I have a very strong opinion that if you're a C++, pro C++ programmer, then you are a performance library programmer. If you are not a performance library programmer and, and claim to be a C++ programmer, I'm sorry to tell you that you're not going to make it, okay? But I have good news for you. There are other choices not involved in C++ to make lots of money with software engineering. So if you could do C++, a, a, a C++ programming, then the world is your oyster. But if your C++ libraries are good, okay, in this particular programming language, I think it happens more often. And by the way, I, I am a multi-programming language uh, engineer, as uh, many others. I know Python, Perl, uh, um, JavaScript, uh, Java, and so on. And uh, I have used them in a professional context uh, many times. So I, I think I can call myself a, 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 someone who can professionally work on multiple programming languages. But there is this particularity about uh, how in C++ your libraries tend to be used in unanticipated ways. And when they are used in unanticipated ways is when they produce the most value, okay? So uh, they, there's some intelligence coded that emerges from a good C++ library. And uh, there is some unanticipated complexity that uh, you cannot uh, uh, anticipate how people are going to use your libraries. And that unpredictability, it means like, uh, imagine the challenge of uh, doing a library when you don't even know how it is going to be used, right? 
the reason for for um, that uh, phenomenon of uh, your libraries are used in an anticipated ways is because templates, of course, and because uh, Stepanov's uh, genetic programming paradigm is true, and and uh, it found its home at uh, C++ because C++ has the expressiveness and the performance economy that uh, makes it so. Okay, I want you to bear one question in mind. Um, if you want to ask yourself how to know that your templates are any good, then you have to see how they help whoever uses your templates, okay? If uh, what your templates are helping your users is uh, the equivalent of a type unsafe copy uh, uh, and pasting with a search and replace, like a, basically the same code, but uh, in a type safe way, uh, replaced uh, with a, a new type, you're already helping a lot. And uh, if you do that, congratulations, because you have reached the, the uppermost uh, uh, level of usefulness of code in a language such as Java, because that's as far as, for example, Java genetics go. But there is another level beyond that, which is when you help footer than uh, than um, just uh, copy and, and, and replace. And we will see with uh, subtyping that uh, type erasure is one of those things that uh, gives you more powerful modeling powers while you can, it's, those templates are going to give you more than, than just a, a, a simple uh, search and replace, uh, copy and paste or, or, or more simple uh, templates will give you. All right, so what is the ghost of a good template? And by the way, um, I am using the word ghost as uh, the Merriam-Webster uh, defines it, the seed of life or intelligence. I believe that the ghost of good templates are the concepts that uh, it works with, okay? And it is the time to give you some examples. Concepts within C++ of generic programming. The concept of the destructor, all right? You had also, an interesting set of concepts he has uh, in uh, Dave Abraham's exception safety levels is, uh, is something that arose within C++ and uh, basically all other object-oriented languages have adopted and it's a truly useful modeling tool. The whole of uh, the standard template library at least has a, it was originally articulated by Alexander Stepanov is a, a very rich source of uh, truly insightful uh, concepts, okay? So what is the ghost insights that you manifest through genetic programming concepts? Um, I just had the experience at uh, C++ now in Aspen, Colorado, that uh, I saw a, a discussion, a, a, a debate between uh, John Lagos and Dave Abrams about uh, whether vector pushback should offer the strong exception safety guarantee or not. Now, a lot of people might see such a, an argument and they, they might ask themselves, are they just uh, hair splitting? Are they uh, just uh, going through the motions of an argument that is equivalent to, to the genre of the angels or, or, or something Byzantine like that? Take, take into account that in many situations, the question is basically not relevant because, uh, for example, in a vector, the type might be an integer and, and uh, the programming environment might not care at all about uh, failing an allocation of the new buffer. And so in general, that situation would be when there are no exceptions anyway, right? So it is very dependent on the type that uh, use that you want to give it and uh, the type of element in the, in the vector too. Uh, this discussion that they're having, they do not refer at all to any particular uh, element type. They are just talking about vectorhood in a very abstract way. So the point that I want to bring is that what they are discussing is unanticipated uses. For all of the uses that we have in, in, in mind, we already know what is the optimal behavior of, a, uh, of what a vector should be, and we can program for that. The argument about uh, the exception safety guarantee is about the unanticipated use. It is about uh, things that are not happening right now, that but might happen in the future. And what's going to be the answer? What's going to be the path that we want uh, the programmers to take? And then there's this accusation that is very persistent about all of C++, which is that perhaps we are just over-engineering things. So what is it that we're doing with that we are not over-engineering? Let me give you an example. Move semantics, okay? Move semantics, 
was invented to provide a strong uh, uh, exception guarantee for vector pushback in a way that uh, didn't have the performance implication that the old formulation had. Okay, but move semantics is like a, something new. Uh, the swapping was the precedent. By the way, if you see the, the, the textbooks on uh, uh, algorithms and data structures, they don't tell you about uh, uh, moving an element from one side to another. <clears throat> They talk about swapping and the count of swaps that you do for sorting in quick sort or whatever. <clears throat> and I have heard from a friend that, that uh, he says that most semantics, because it is something specific to C++, is like clapping with one hand, something that doesn't quite work. Now, let's leave that uh, uh, uncertainty and that debate uh, in suspension for a moment. But if you value this feature, I'm going to tell you what's my opinion. Move semantics is part of a system of other features, including swapping no except as operator, no except has a call signature annotation, and they together give you something great or give me something that I consider to be great, which is this is the way to make things that won't fail, that are guaranteed that won't fail, and make things that tell me using, for example, the no except uh, as an operator to query whether an expression may throw an exception or not. So to say that uh, something doesn't fail and, or well, actually to make something that won't fail, to say that it won't fail and uh, to know that it, that it says that it won't fail. So all of these things make it so that I can use a very important feature or, or, or style of programming in C++, which is you can program in an optimistic way because the, in most cases, if an exception happens, then the, the, the source code is going to do the right thing. The, the, the local variables are going to be destroyed and the side effects are bound to, to, to temporaries that our local variables are going to be uh, uh, taken care of and so on. So you can program in this optimistic or oblivious to, to failure way. And these are uh, no exceptions and move semantics is what uh, further improves on, 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 on that uh, obliviousness, okay? And also, it bears mentioning that uh, I, for me, it is less important, but uh, sure, knowing that something won't uh, cause a problem allows you to, to, to make a better performance choices. Okay, so this is an, an, an example of a concept. And it is something relatively simple, but it has profound impl implications. That is the, the topic that we are ventilating at the moment, which is emergent behavior. So let's define it once and for all. What does the Wikipedia say on emergence? When an entity is observed to have properties, its parts do not have on their own properties or behaviors which emerge only when the parts interact in a wider whole. So what this is telling us is that uh, there are uh, the conditions under which uh, simple things interact with each other and give rise to something truly interesting. And we just saw examples of uh, one particular language feature, Move Semantics, and the combination of Move Semantics with other things that give you a richness that, um, in particular, myself, I don't find in other programming languages. Maybe I should learn Rust and, and, and uh, be able to make the comparison with that information. But at the moment, I'm, I'm not yet a programmer in Rust. Okay, so. Um, this is uh, related to complex systems and the concept of uh, self-organization. This is a diagram that uh, touches on uh, many of the different things. So this is a multidisciplinary concern. There are many different things that uh, have to do with emergence, emerging behavior. So my, my, my attempt today to convey to you what is the relevance of, of emergence to software engineering is about to, to, to be tied up. The focus is simple rules that lead to complex and intelligent behavior. Okay, let's give you one example, a phenomenal example of uh, simple rules that lead to complex and intelligent behavior. Useful, interesting, beautiful. Because by the way, uh, uh, emergence behavior also touches on the arts. Okay, um, so uh, what you see in this, uh, in this uh, GIF animation, is that uh, from a simple uh, pattern 
that uh, was specified initially. The, um, the algorithm of wave function collapsed by, uh, 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 sorry, I forgot the name, uh, Maxine Gomins. Uh, the wave function collapse. The wave function collapse uh, takes a pattern and uh, a few restrictions, and it automatically does a, uh, what is called procedural content generation. And uh, it leads to surprisingly intricate, beautiful things that can be used in video games and, and uh, uh, is something that's not going to repeat. So it, you have infinite replayability if you use uh, this procedural content generation in a video game, for example. Uh, on the right, we see uh, simple patterns and uh, what different runs of uh, the wave function collapse algorithm um, uh, generate, uh, especially like uh, the one at the bottom, that's why I put it uh, far larger. You have a set of primitives in the left and the arrow indicates that uh, that allows the wave function collapse to, to um, uh, combine it in the different ways that uh, you see. So it's basically like a simulating a, a a printed circuit board. Then, uh, of course, that this also works in the three-dimensional space. And uh, all I want to say about this slide is that uh, the rules to generate something has intricate, as uh, this uh, building with uh, the many uh, stairs and passageways, the, the rules are um, very, very simple. And the wave function collapse is based on uh, a, a theoretical, I think, breakthrough that uh, that um, Maxime introduced to the world, which is uh, the minimal entropy heuristic. So basically the combination of the primitives that are provided to wave function collapse are such that uh, it reduces the entropy of uh, the resulting combination. That's what makes it pleasant. Okay, um, uh, this is not a presentation about this algorithm, of course, but I'm just uh, uh, mentioning it has an example of simple rules that uh, lead to amazingly complex or interesting uh, results. But why do we need it in C++ or in software engineering? Well, we want to accomplish fundamentally hard things. Imagine the range of what C++ is used for. It begins perhaps in uh, image processing and goes all the way to machine learning, artificial intelligence. What I do of uh, uh, augmented reality, all of those things, okay? And uh, the only way in which we can tackle the very complicated things that are our, our end goals uh, is, uh, is by uh, keeping simplicity throughout. So we want simple things that lead to solutions that are truly um, sophisticated and therefore they can tackle the complexity of reality. For that we need an expressive language. And uh, we have perhaps too much expressivity in C++. Our tools are very poor because of that. But we do have an expressive language. Uh, among other things, it also lets you switch between uh, programming paradigms on the fly. You don't, have, you don't have to commit to any of them. And, and uh, this is truly fundamental. That's, that's why also programming in C++ is particularly hard because sometimes you're programming the functional programming paradigm. Some other times you're doing generic programming, some other object oriented. And there are many others like uh, data oriented too. Yeah, we also need an efficient language, and uh, well, yeah, I will show you uh, at, at least uh, with uh, some frameworks like uh, uh, yours truly, uh, type erasure lets you model more complex subtyping relations than the feature of inheritance and overrides virtual, while attaining even better end performance of, of, of the system or the components, okay? And this is something that I have proved on previous previous presentations. So it's not a not a focus today. It's just that this exists and uh, delivers some things that go beyond the language, which is part of the subject matter. Okay, so what we want is maximum simplicity to complex intelligent behavior leverage. Okay, we want to keep simplicity on the things that we do, the work that we the, the put in. And we want to obtain as much intelligent and complex behavior as a result. So what is in the middle that allows to put simplicity in and get lots of complexity at the end? 
this is the phenomenology of type of uh, of uh, emerging behavior that uh, I wanted to share with you. Okay, C++ has phenomenally great compile time polymorphism. This is super well covered because we have templates, including template specializations, which already uh, uh, go way, way, way beyond the most uh, languages that have generics. Um, we also have function overloads, and function overloads by itself is a, a pattern matching a mechanism that is truly, truly powerful. And uh, then we can do much more than this. Like for, you have the whole thing of metaprogramming. Some C++ programs are metaprogramming, and uh, in C++ in particular, it is a functional programming of higher, higher order concepts. I don't want to delve into the theory for obvious reasons, but uh, what I want to mean is that the part of what we can do at compilation time in C++ is particularly powerful, much more powerful than, than basically all other uh, uh, common uh, languages in common use. Now, the focus or when we talk about type erasure is runtime polymorphism. So it is a good time to uh, recapitulate. I know that uh, both Nicolas and uh, um, Klaus have mentioned this, but uh, again, it is we want substitutability, like uh, for example, to put the cat or, or, or the dog when you want to pet uh, a pet. Substitutability. And this is what uh, was first articulated the concept of the, the concept behind the Liskov substitution principle. Just that uh, in C++ in particular, uh, subtyping doesn't mean subclassing. What I mean is that uh, the relationship of subtyping can be implemented without uh, the language feature of inheritance. There is the conventional support for runtime polymorphism that we know of inheritance and virtual overrides. It has its problems, but uh, at least it is the conventional, and therefore everybody is expected to, to, to be able to use it. For cases in which the subtyping is bounded to a, a set of subtypes that are known beforehand, when, when you are already, you already know the, the subtypes by the time that you're writing the code, then you have a subtype like a standard variant. And if you use a standard variant, when, when it is applicable, that you're going to get generally better a software, not just in terms of performance, uh, performance too, but not just uh, in terms of performance, but also a, a modeling and convenience of the code. You, you're going to uh, put yourself in the corner of having to allocate uh, a, an integer, for example, that uh, using a, a inheritance and overrides uh, put you in. And there are other libraries, and that's, this is so important because uh, C++ is so strange in the sense that uh, the libraries using portable features of the language, meaning that uh, any programmer could use, with, with libraries that use only portable things, you can get basically what would be the equivalent of programming language features in other programming languages. And there are options like, for example, a standard function, and uh, even smart pointers, I, I hope that Klaus uh, will agree with me that uh, a smart pointer is an example of, of uh, the application of the design pattern of uh, type erasure. I believe that uh, in, 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 a, in some prior draft, um, he was going to mention that example, but it's, it's fine that uh, we went with Nicolas's uh, uh, pets. So now if, uh, if uh, compilation time is so great, wouldn't it be cool to use the great features of compilation time to the runtime uh, needs that we have for our application? So then um, type erasure in general is a, a design pattern that is uh, very difficult to explain that requires uh, an, an excellent educator like uh, Klaus more than an hour to explain it because it, it puts together a diversity of uh, ingredients to accomplish something that uh, the ingredients by themselves cannot uh, cannot achieve. Okay, and what are those ingredients? Well, you have the very prominently the external polymorphism design pattern, which, by the way, I discovered thanks to Klaus's presentation last year. 
I sort of knew that it existed, but I didn't uh, uh, know about this forum uh, about this formalism. And this is very important. I will tell you why in a moment. Um, uh, all of the configurability and the the way to express choices, because at at, at, at the end uh, uh, there are many choices for the user, and also choices for the implementer. The library author about uh, how to uh, to put these things uh, together. So you need plentiful of uh, relations of uh, things that uh, can be described using the the um, design pattern of a strategy. Um, you also need in the um, in, in the case of type erasure mechanisms to manage to handle the values we just saw with uh, Nicola's presentation that there were like uh, several generations of uh, his implementation of type erasure and uh, that it progr progressively took more control about uh, the object that it manages. And I will tell you something about the uh, object management in a moment. It, and uh, so you already have three really tough uh, uh, um, uh, ingredients, external polymorphism, the strategy, the design pattern, and uh, all of the mechanisms for the value, value management. And internally, you have prototypes, facades, uh, uh, bridges, decorators, uh, uh, proxies, and many others. Well, the observation is that type erasure implementations is a choice of how to combine these things together. I do believe that there is a lot of value in doing it yourself. Like, uh, please give Nicolas a, a, um, a, 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 Nicolas a presentation, a really close look, because uh, all of that he's doing there, uh, implicitly, they have subtlety and uh, design patterns and, and, and important lessons on how to do day-to-day -day, uh, C++ work. Is putting together several indirections and, and and so on. And well, if you want to learn, for example, a, a good uh, a use of the strategy design pattern, you have Nicholas's presentation for that. You can go back to 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 Klaus uh, Eagleberger's and CppCon, and he calls um, model things that uh, a, Nicholas calls interface. There was a, a set of great questions. Uh, moments ago, uh, somebody wanted to know about that, and I think that uh, uh, Nicholas is hitting the 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 right tone because the people that are asking the questions are asking truly good questions. Well, this is a really good opportunity to 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 see why Nicholas uses some language while Klaus uses a different one, because there are subtlety and there are details there that uh, you might miss. So doing it yourself is a way to learn that I consider to be very valuable. Even though there might be frameworks like, a, 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 but there might be frameworks that uh, a, are, are going to be more production ready. Okay. Another property on in type ratio is that there is a synergy. The capabilities of many things put together give rise to powers that are not possible to replicate with uh, subsets of that of those uh, things. In particular, something truly desirable in software engineering, which is composability. Okay, how to achieve subtyping with a uh, type erasure? Typically, there is some compile time mechanism to activate the desired runtime behavior. Uh, in the case of a standard function, all you need is that uh, the operator of calling, the parenthesis operator, is uh, of the right signature. If that is available, then that compilation time fact that uh, that class has a, an operator of calling of the right signature can be used to achieve the runtime polymorphism needs that, uh, that you wanted, okay? And uh, the really important part is that this Subtyping is a, a relation that is not directly expressed in the code. It, in, in a way, it, pre, it predates. It is. It happens. The, 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 the existence of the subtyping relation happens before you set to write the code. So what you end up doing with type erasure is to go and uh, express, tell the, the system, the compiler, the framework that yeah, this object type 
satisfies the polymorphic behavior, the subtyping relation that, 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 that is implicit in the annotation. Before I explain this uh, better, I noticed that uh, there are some questions, so I'm going to take a moment to, to answer the questions. Uh, I think that Klaus doesn't need to read them to me because uh, I have uh, the Twitch uh, on my side, so I can read them uh, out loud. Why do you call a standard variant runtime? Since in my experience, when I used uh, a, a standard visit along with the variant and necessary visitor functions, it complained at compile time that the visitor function for one of the variant types doesn't exist. That is a good question. Why do I call it a runtime? Because uh, um, a, a, a standard variant is uh, the attempt to leverage as much as possible when you were talking about of the compilation time that it can even give you an error that uh, there is a mismatch in the standard visit that you wanted a compilation time as opposed to discovering at one time, like it happens in other doc type languages, like uh, you ask uh, in Python for a method that an object doesn't have, and then you have a nasty runtime error there. Well, this is a compilation time error that's precisely the, the, the a strong type safety guarantees of C++ come to, to help you. But fundamentally, variant is to use a type that you don't know exactly what it's going to be at runtime. So you're going to treat it the same, but uh, I don't know. Let's say that it is a variant between an integer and a string, typical. Like you have an interpreter for some other language, and uh, it can represent, so some object in that language can represent a number or can represent uh, uh, a string. And for that matter, a, a number has an integer or a number has a floating point. Well. It is runtime because you don't know what is the nature of the actual type that you're going to get in the runtime. I hope that answered the question. Okay. Um, so this ties into what we were talking about, okay? It is subtyping relations. If you have a string, for example, you have the expectation that the string is a, something that you're going to be able to concatenate. If you have an integer, you have the expectation that uh, uh, you're going to be able to add them together, for example. But uh, these are behaviors that require their essential nature, okay? Like uh, the concatenation of an integer with an integer doesn't really make sense. Um, so, uh, but come on, like for example, displaying it in the in the console, like uh, or saving saving an integer to persisting an integer to a file, the the the, the subtyping relation of persisting. Um, also applies to a string. You might want to, to, to save a string to a file. So that is a subtyping relation. And you can substitute in an integer or a, um, a string. And as a matter of fact, the whole of uh, serialization is uh, a, making that um, a, 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 a persistability subtyping relation um, a reality, the, the reification of that uh, of that uh, uh, type in relation. Okay, so uh, in in the particular case of type erasure, the relation between between uh, the, the adherence to the subtype is not made explicit in the code until very very late, which is when you use something for type erasure that brings that uh, fundamental reality that the subtyping was a, a match. So in a way. All that we do with type erasure is a type annotation. You are saying that uh, this other type is capable of doing this ability. Let's call that ability affordance. Okay, now we're getting to the part of uh, the tying it up with emergent behavior because type erasure accomplishes opposites. You have the ability to express that semantic binding that something satisfies a subtyping relation, like for example, that an integer is something that uh, you can put to an output stream without any changes to the source code other than the use of type erasure itself, the annotation itself. So a very powerful subtyping indication without the code having to suffer intrusively for it. That those are two opposites. 
very, 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 very contrary to each other. Another contradiction is that this is something very powerful that is implemented as a, as a library using normal features of the language rather than requiring something special, some magic. It's not a language feature, it just uses languages feature and it's put together as a library. Another property that I find uh, contradictory is that even though if it is a library, it, it, it at all by itself is quite surprising, it outcompetes the performance of uh, the comparative language feature. In particular, you can have value semantics like uh, Klaus was indicating. And uh, you, for example, you can disable run type, uh, run time type information. You can profile your call signature so that you don't lose performance by converting the natural call signature that you need into a call signature in which, uh, for example, the this parameter has to be the first implicit argument. And you also have much stronger modeling powers. But if I were to explain the, the strength of the modeling powers, then I would make a, a, an unsuitable theoretical presentation for you guys. So um, there are other resources that you can see what I mean by this. Now, allow me a moment to, to talk to you about the pseudotype erasure framework, okay? The first generation was uh, made in 2017. By the way, this is open source. Uh, and the attempt was to get better performance at it than, than the standard function, uh, much better configurability, and a few modeling power in, uh, improvements, okay? And those things were accomplished uh, and I'm very happy with the results. The only drawback that he had is that everything was ad hoc. Like uh, I couldn't tell, couldn't articulate any theory behind it of why I chose the things that I that I, that I chose. Then um, about uh, December of 19, it is when I discovered a mechanism that uh, could be used and if we had the time, we will see it uh, at the end. Uh, but by the way, I think I am about the end. Um, the ability to uh, to shop for for capabilities, okay? Like uh, what uh, Klaus was saying in his uh, presentation of um, uh, adding a straightforward capabilities, that uh, let's call it uh, affordances, uh, um, it meaning to represent uh, it has many subtypes as you want. I'm gonna um, say that uh, this is a feature that no other type of operation framework known to me uh, is uh, even remotely capable of having. Um, when uh, I uh, uh, worked on, on um, improvements to the second generation, I discovered that uh, I could add uh, a binary affordances, like for example, the convertibility from one type of object held to a different type of object held, like typically uh, you might want uh, something that at runtime, it can have the nature of a string or the nature of a number, but if the representation of a number is the content of a string, then you might want to be able to convert that representation of, of, of a number in a string to, to a proper number, basically like uh, what JavaScript does with uh, strings. Yeah, so this is a, a, a binary capability because uh, it requires to know the, the the type that it begins with and the type that it wants to convert to. So there are two types involved there, that, that's binary. Uh, and and uh, further dimensionality makes sense, but it's more complicated. It, this is like a, a very uh, strong generalization of the visual design pattern, which is a uh, the, the the tool in object orientation to achieve uh, binary capabilities. Now I'm working on the third generation, which is all of the all of the things that we have uh, already with great performance, but in the interest of uh, making it usable to as much people as possible, in the interest of being able to continue to improve it further. I need to use very well articulated concepts and design patterns. It cannot be ad hoc. I had to make the, the big effort of reflecting 
my superior understanding about the design patterns that are reflected in uh, what I what I've done has a salient feature that 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 the people that first see it can know can connect what is happening to to concepts previous, previously articulated. Oh, I think uh, I made a mistake of uh, repeating the uh, slide. Um, say, yes, uh, uh, maybe uh, some one little thing that I was forgetting to mention is that uh, there is another feature coming, which is a uh, data-oriented value manager. So far, I have replicated what everybody else has of um, pointer-based uh, value managers. And now I want to replicate uh, what uh, data-oriented frameworks uh, have of referring things uh, through indices most of the time and, and being able to scatter the fields of an object uh, into arrays of fields, as opposed to having a structure of arrays, you have, uh, no, sorry, uh, um, uh, uh, instead of having arrays of structures, you will have a structure of arrays with the fields. That's something that I talked uh, at CPPCon last year. Okay. The state of type erasure for, 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 for me to talk to, to your user group, I absolutely have to go about what was the state of uh, SUTA operation in October of uh, 2021 last year. And the reason is going to be very clear momentarily. Uh, at that point in time, I had already explained uh, at several fora the characteristics and, and um, the features that it had, okay? The CPPCon 2020 talks about the performance. It's called uh, uh, not leaving performance on the jump table because it talks about uh, Activating on-time behavior in general, and type erasure was prominent. In London, at the London C++ users group, I have a presentation on it's called "Type Erasing the Pains of Runtime Polymorphism," and it delivers on exactly that. Um, C++ now 2021. I also showed how other programming languages in the presentation with uh, Phil Nash, polymorphism a la carte. Uh, other programming languages have other mechanisms for runtime polymorphism, and they can emulate and simulate it with type erasure. And my framework uh, has the capabilities to just do that. But it continues to be ad hoc. So this makes it hard to discover, like uh, matching the need to the capability in the framework. It is so hard to document that I tried it several times and I couldn't. There were some concepts that were escaping me. And I also have the problem that there, there isn't even theory to point to, like uh, uh, to ask the interested party, please study this thing. I know that it's difficult, but uh, this is going to give you the answer to what you're asking, because like for all I know, for example, what I call polyphyletic uh, subtyping relations is uh, something that is a, a novel concept that uh, I am inventing the jargon for it and nobody else has ever talked about it. And what is polyphyletic uh, subtyping relations? When, um, uh, uh, that's the theoretical, maybe I should uh, not uh, uh, bother you uh, momentarily with that, but uh, uh, type erasure is particularly good for this type of uh, subtyping relations and, and uh, the other uh, tools to model them that I've seen in other languages are not good at all for, for, for polyphyletic subtyping relations. Then this presentation happened. And by the way, uh, Klaus and I had uh, a interaction prior to, to um, CPPCon, and I knew that uh, what he was going to be talking about was already uh, turning the gears in my head about how to do uh, a much better job with my own framework. And uh, now, it is a before and after, November of 2021. Now I have something very, very clear, which is I need to describe the choreography of the sign patterns involved in uh, type erasure, and in particular, my uh, the framework that I worked on. Because what Klaus did was, going back to the citation at the very beginning of this presentation, that articulation of, of external polymorphism strategies, and uh, the models and, and uh, so on, is the clarity of purpose that was missing. The, the part that uh, uh, was an artisanal product as opposed to an engineering product, my type ratio framework. So with, uh, I really had to thank uh, Klaus. And I understand that um, 
in this uh, very group, there was an earlier version of uh, what he ended up presenting at CPPCon. So um, I am saying this uh, to render tribute to, to your efforts. Your efforts have echoes and uh, hopefully are going to make things better for everyone. Okay, um, it will be a good time to, to see if there are questions to give people uh, a moment uh, of pausing. And uh, if you guys uh, wanted, uh, um, we can go for a demo. Uh, I promise that it's not going to be a very heavy demo, but something that I shared with uh, Andreas Weiss when we were in Aspen. And uh, I, would, I would like uh, Klaus, Andreas, what do you think uh, we should do now? So please go ahead. There is no time constraint. Um, it shouldn't take an hour though, but uh, I believe it will be in the range of 10 to 15 minutes. Is it? Is this correct? Hopefully in the five minute uh, range, okay. okay? Okay, absolutely no problem. Please go ahead. Yes, so um, let me stop presentation of uh, that thing and uh, stop sharing so that I can confirm and stop sharing. And I'm going to share a different screen. The feedback on the tweet chat that the demo would be awesome um, was noticed, so we're doing it, okay? Very good. So uh, let us uh, first uh, uh, tell you a, a few things, okay? These are resources that are available to you, the public. Um, I can give you the the link. Um, uh, this will be enough for you to see these. Uh, I'm, I'm going to put it in the sh in the show notes or something like that. And by the way, I think that Andreas Weiss himself has uh, the link that I, that we're starting with. And uh, one thing that I want to first pointing out is that the implementations that everybody does, uh, Sean Parent, Klaus Eagleberg, uh, Nicholas Cachot, all the implementations when they try to introduce a uh, type erasure begin by um, a, a showing a, um, um, Oh, by the way, yes, thank you, Klaus. You guys are welcome to, to join in the code uh, yourselves. I'm going to try to read the, the line numbers out loud if you want to do it in your own computer. The, the implementations of type erasure, they all use inheritance and virtual, which is the evil that we want to remove, right? But hello, this implementation is completely self-contained within this um, uh, ex uh, Compiler Explorer link. And by the way, the only problem is that the, the comments that are truly helpful to understand what's going on have been removed because uh, my employer asked me some modicum of uh, secrecy. So like, for example, I strip the comments out. Uh, it's just normal pre-processing. Uh, I'm, I'm showing you code that um, is not publicly available, but it's very close to the publicly available one. Of course, that I had this dichotomy because uh, we are improving my coworkers and I were improving this framework uh, from within my employer. And uh, it, it is a little involved to get the permission to, to, to share it on the outside. But virtual, this is all the uses of virtual within this framework, in particular, no use of the virtual keyword. Okay, so none of that, yet we have Full polymorphism. And uh, um, the, the, the probably what you're interested in is at the very bottom. Um, let us uh, close this thing. At the very bottom, we have a, an example, okay? Which is, um, let me introduce to you to several concepts here, okay? Um, the, the SU type erasure framework is uh, fully configurable, which means that you're gonna be telling it what you want. You can use the false, but in general, you, you, you tell it uh, what you want. In this particular example, we are defining a policy or a strategy for the container. That is, uh, the first argument is how big and what is the alignment of the local buffer that you want. In this particular case, we're going to make it so that uh, it can have two void pointers. So 
any pointer, just two of them. The alignment is going to be eight bytes typically. If uh, you put uh, something like a, uh, your type here, then it's going to be the size of your type and the alignment of your type. Um, we have here that uh, the capabilities that we want is uh, um, destructibility in the normal way, which by the way, there are other destructibilities. There is a destructibility that does, that does nothing which is uh, interesting because uh, when you have multi-threaded uh, multi components, you might want to have a global variable that, or a thread local variable that is uh, multi-threaded. And the destruction of the team would, would run in contexts that are difficult to, to synchronize. So you might not uh, want uh, to, to destroy them at uh, thread joining because maybe thread joining is a synonymous for uh, application ending. So you just uh, 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 leave it... Uh, uh, on, on destroyed. So there might be the, the destruction capability of implementing the destruction has a, a no op. Uh, this uh, form of um, this form of uh, destructibility uh, uses uh, a reflection and introspection capability that relies on a function pointer to a template being unique, but uh, that causes a problem if you want to use the compilation, the linking option of uh, identical code folding. And so there is another affordance, which is the uh, identical code folding safe uh, affordance. Uh, movability does the normal uh, movability. And look, this, this thing that I have right now uh, compiles, I can prove to you by, by changing it. And uh, this is going to actually go through the compiler and uh, just gonna run, right? But just in the interest of showing you how easy it is to add and remove capabilities, I'm just going to remove the the uh, affordance, uh, the so-called Andreas affordance, and it's going to give you an error. And the error is that uh, I cannot invoke the process method on a type erasure container that uses that policy. So before going that, I'm going to take a couple more minutes to continue uh, the example. But the policy in general tells the framework, this is how I like uh, the local buffer. And these are the capabilities that I want uh, my type erase team to have. Now, I tell, um, I'm going to use that policy for a full-fledged any container. Why the two steps? Because the policy is the configuration for a guy like this. You can have some other type of container that is not any container per se. It doesn't have exactly the same user interface as any container. And so, well, this is a combination of, I want that policy, those capabilities for the normal any container for type erasure that I have. All right, so that means uh, something that is capable of holding any object that is capable of uh, supporting the Andreas affordance, meaning a type that, uh, an object of a type that satisfies the substitutability for um, Andreas. Now, um, that's already useful, very useful, but let us transform it in something very, very close to a standard function. And we're gonna use the, the type operator sub function that is gonna take something capable of doing a type erasure, that's gonna be the type erasure provider that I'm putting there, and it's going to have a particular signature. I think that the signature is uh, defined uh, over here. Uh, it begins with a void pointer and it has uh, four integers, okay? So this would be, this guy would be a order consumer. Well, by the way, this is, a, I'm building on an example that I already gave at CPPCon two years ago. And uh, that's on purpose so that people see that they continue, the continuity if you wanted to revisit that example. Uh, this ought to be uh, compiling again. Um, so the, the order consumer is something that can be called has a standard function with the signature that I showed you a moment ago, but also has the ability of doing process as uh, Andreas indicated. Okay. Um, now I want you to notice that uh, in the original policy, there is no copyability. So 
an ordered consumer is not copyable. It just doesn't know how to copy. But I can do the following. Creating a policy that takes the whole of the ordered consumer has its basis before. This is a, a different type of operator. It is a, a, a derived table policy. Order consumer, I'm going to introduce not just the copyability ability, but also I guess for, for why not, the run type type information ability, okay? So um, by the way, let's play the same trick or from an example that has more capabilities, removing one and see what is the error that we get. Oh, we, we, have, we were not using it, but we're going to use it uh, momentarily so uh, we can leave it. And uh, um, that, again, that gives you a policy. That's why it is a derived table P of derived table policy. And derived table is going to be the SUNY container that uses that as, a, as a, its policy. Ah, but you see, the derived table equivalent of function is copyable. It is uh, proven by uh, this uh, is copy constructible uh, thing. Um, this is an example of, uh, a, it turns out that an integer is able to satisfy Andreas as a foreign, so we're going to uh, see it uh, momentarily. And therefore, you can convert an integer to, um, to, to the thing that has that capability. Uh, we can we can also have a, a pointer to a function uh, uh, or a function here. Uh, these uh, two formulations are equivalent, so let's use the address to make it more explicit. Um, we can convert a, a function pointer to something that uh, is copyable and all those beautiful things. And uh, excuse me for the abbreviation. Uh, this is what uh, invocates the, the um, affordance that Andreas and I worked on. No, this is the time of uh, showing you how do you make a new capability available for um, the um, uh, a new capability for the um, the, the um, any container in general? Okay, so it has to have. This member, it is not in use here, but uh, the data affordance system I use it. So uh, we are not going to explain all of the details today, but uh, capabilities that well. Andreas told me that uh, what he wanted was uh, something that uh, can be called with an integer and uh, returns a Boolean. So uh, I represented it uh, to support the capability. I'm going to put uh, a function pointer of the signature in the V table entry. Uh, this is uh, um, a default implementation that we wanted for the behavior that uh, Andreas was thinking about. This line here, the, the 1390, says, okay, for a default constructed, for a default constructed in a container that has this affordance, what you're going to do is to invoke the return files that uh, it is going to return false. Hello. Ah. But uh, if it is a properly constructed uh, any container, meaning that it contains a value in there, you're going to invoke this function uh, implementation, and you're going to pass in the, the value manager, the real value manager type has an argument, because this is a template. And um, the real value manager is used here. And um, you get to know what is uh, the type that the value manager is managing by, by um, using the manage type uh, member of the real value manager or the value manager. And uh, this is uh, something that um, uh, gives you the value. And uh, so basically what uh, Andreas wanted the code to be was, if it is uh, the, if the type managed in the container is an integer, then return true. And uh, if not, then return false. It ignores the parameter, but uh, I, I guess that, uh, that, oh no, it doesn't. Actually, it causes a, a side effect of uh, multiplying the, the global variable uh, by V and uh, the, the current value, okay? Uh, this is all made up, of course, because we were just uh, uh, a quick demo of um, 
uh, how it, it, it looks like. Finally, the last uh, member of the affordance that I have to show you is a uh, user affordance. This is the capability that gets added to the any container. So we're going to add the capability of process, and uh, let's call it a process MOOC for Munich users uh, C++. And this is going to give us the, the famous uh, compilation error that we expect. But if we rename it, then it lets us uh, call it MOOC. And what this does is uh, to um, activate the, the entry that we put in the virtual table, um, uh, the, 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 yes, the entry that we put in the virtual table for this affordance. Um, and uh, this uh, also has management on the heap for very large objects or managed uh, in the local buffer, but it gives you value semantics externally. So it delivers on many things. And uh, I have already made the, 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 the point in other presentations about the performance. So uh, we are not going to be, uh, uh, it is uh, what, uh, 9 p.m. for you, uh, we should, ought not to be uh, messing with um, the complications of um, of uh, the performance, okay? So I think, uh, um, well, this is uh, uh, the simple demo that I wanted to show you. I hope that, uh, you see that uh, this is not terribly complicated uh, to do. It has some, yes. Um, I am reading that uh, a question, if I consider Zoo stable enough to be used? And the answer is yes. And uh, what I am doing is uh, I am working on the third generation and I'm gonna launch it as soon as I'm able to, um, to 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 complete the refactory, because again, this is used in production at my employer. Uh, it is literally an important part of uh, the, the snapshot source code source code that that is used in the application that runs by hundreds of billions of daily active users. So, uh, I have a little problem of that. Uh, uh, it is. It is used widely, and so every detail counts, and the validation that every change makes a made, even if it is for good reasons, doesn't alter the behavior of uh, some code that relies on that behavior, is uh, time consuming. Um, and uh, so it is the collaboration of my internal uh, uh, co-workers uh, at the SNAP that um, will have to ask permission to open source it and and so on. But the good news is, number one, what is in GitHub, even though it looks abandoned, it isn't, uh, it, it just works. So I don't put effort into it because it just works. And uh, number two, uh, you can ask me uh, uh, the parallel channels, what is it, what you want the, of the new features that have not yet been implemented. And uh, you might get uh, a draft of those uh, features for your own use. In general, I have always said, please ask me, because uh, it doesn't make sense for me to, to be doing all of the work of, to upstream while uh, I don't know who's going to uh, use that. I hope that uh, that answer, um, um, answered your question. Okay, Klaus, I think that... Uh, um, we might uh, be able to switch to the other platform to continue the conversation. Could you please send me the, the link over Skype because I'm using different uh, uh, connectivity for different things. I definitely will. But first of all, thanks a lot for the talk. This was indeed uh, inspiring and it also contained a real example of the Zoo library. Thank you. So perhaps as a last question, which um, is something that people said about my talk. So if, if you go to YouTube, go to the uh, um, um, the type ratio presentation, then one person is, was actually asking whether this all of this is reasonable. Because, um, you know, dissecting everything into little pieces, and of course they need to work together. Therefore, a lot of access functions, getters, etc. appear in the, in the public interface. And the question essentially was, uh, does this break encapsulation in any way? But, so hopefully I formulated the question properly. What's your take on that? 
Ah, okay. This is a sophisticated question, uh, and it has several facets. The facets right. from for the perspective of the user, okay, this doesn't break encapsulation, all right? Um, because the user can have the public interface and implement the affordances in a way that only consume the public interface of uh, the types that they are declaring the subtyping capability. Yeah. So uh, from that perspective, it's uh, uh, very agnostic and respectful of uh, the user's choices with regards to, to encapsulation. The mechanism of adding a capability to the um, uh, to the user interface of uh, the container itself, um, wouldn't even make sense to make it private because the whole point is uh, what I'm calling a, a, a user affordance in the in the code. The whole point is is to make uh, the end user uh, available to 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 trigger uh, independent behavior. Okay, because of the cultural DNA of being ad hoc, every problem had uh, the first solution that I came up with. Everything within uh, the framework itself is uh, completely public. As a matter of fact, I pride myself in saying that my code has no class. Mm -hmm. So it's a double entendre, like uh, yeah. it doesn't have class because I don't use the keyword class and it doesn't have class because uh, it is not uh, made uh, to adhere to the purest uh, standards because I am a practitioner. Good news is that uh, the, the framework actually respects quite fastidiously the language. So this is truly portable C++ code. I am not engaging in a type pointing here and there that uh, is uh, uh, not uh, it's, uh, according to the rules of the language. And the reason is because I was scared, scared that less about the, doing something that breaks the rules of the language in a way that, that I don't anticipate, and then creating a, pro, a, a production problem or application that that hundreds of millions of users uh, use. Okay. Right. So. Okay. Thank you.